Okay, we are now at 8.31. I was having mic issues, but that's okay. I got it fixed. But welcome back, PM Peeps. This is the first project that we're going to look at today in regards to project management. I'm really excited to share this with you, and I really hope you enjoy it. I do want to cover a couple things that I failed to mention in my last stream. Unfortunately, I had so much technical difficulty by the time I finally posted my last stream. It was apparent I was a little tired. So one thing I failed to mention was that for the streaming, I will be posting, well, not posting, but streaming every two weeks. So this is the exception because if you're seeing my first video my or my first stream, obviously you know that it was last week and now you're like, oh, well, you're doing it again. Well, yeah, because next week I got some other things I have going on. So we'll start off the whole cadence of streaming once every two weeks will be twice a month. But since streams do expire, you can always go to my YouTube channel. It's the same name as the streaming channel, PM Corner, where you're able to, you know, watch old streams from beginning to end. And you don't have to worry about, well, if I can't see it on Twitch, you can at least see it still on YouTube. So I just wanted to add that little piece in there. Um, so, of course, we're going to get started. And like I've talked about in the last stream, we're covering the basics first before we get started on the project itself. So we have our processes, phases of a project, and the seven key items that must always be remembered. So if you remember from last time, we have initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing. So initiating is where we're trying to identify the business value of a project. That's a important because from the seven key items that relates to the business value and the project charter because the business value feeds the project charter itself. Then once you've got approval for the project charter, you move into planning, which is where you get the project management plan, which is key item number three. That is where you are setting up the blueprint of how all your processes are going to be done from beginning to end of the project. And then of course you have executing, monitoring, controlling. Think of them as paternal twins. They happen at the same time. They do different things. Executing creates the work performance data you're going to get, whereas monitoring and controlling takes the work performance data and turns it into information and then a report, which then leads into the question of, do I need to make a change, which leads into another seven key item, the integrated change control process. And that's very important when you need to make adjustments to your project. And that's also OK. In the real world, people tend to look at, you know, integrated change control as a negative thing. They don't look at it as a positive because they think that, oh, because I made a change, it didn't do anything right. No, not true. It just means that, you know, sometimes you got to make a change and that's OK. It's not any different than agile where, you know, in retrospectives, we naturally think of change instead of having to integrate a process for change. But of course, there's nothing wrong with either process. And then of course, closing, which is where you get your lessons learned. That's where you're closing everything off. You're finalizing your product. You're also putting all your items back into the OPAs, your organizational process assets for the historic piece of it. And of course, your lessons learned, which is also a key item. And then finally, just to cover the last key item, since it's kind of all throughout and natural, is your enterprise environmental factors. These are things you can't control in your project one way or another. Just can't happen, won't happen, it's the end of it, you know, and you just got to do and make do with it. Then, of course, you have your different processes. You have your integration management. That is your conveyor belt that makes all the other processes work together as a whole. Then you have scope, schedule, and cost. Now, of course, PMI doesn't really want to do the whole PM triangle anymore, kind of and sort of, because at the end of the day, everything is affected. But at the end of the day, if something's wrong with your scope, cost, or schedule, or all three at the same time, or one or two of the three at the same time, you got problems, and everything else is just impacted anyways. Then, of course, you got your quality, which is, you know, your standards. How are you going to make your product and the standards you have to meet to make that product? Resources, that's your people, your machines, your material, things that you need to make the project successful. Communications, obvious. You're, you're communicating. How are you communicating with people? Risk, it's the items where, 
Um, you may have issues that occur, but you set aside contingency to be able to address those risks in some way, shape, or form. Then you have procurement, which is how you're going to procure items, whether that be, again, materials, people, um, whatever it is to make the project run. Then finally, you do have your stakeholders who are the people that are your client. And at the end of the day, your client is the very person that's going to tell you how, thing, how they want things and what they want out of the project. But you also need to keep in mind that there is a thing called expectation management. And this is where that's gonna play a huge role in this one, um, which of course, this one in particular was very interesting to research and I'm excited to share. Now we are going to apply project management concepts to the Challenger Space Shuttle. Now here's how I'm gonna just give you the layout again. So we're gonna summarize what happened. We're going to talk about you know some key items that came out of this research and then we're gonna show pretty much in what phases and processes did things kind of, you know, fall through the cracks or the ball was dropped, however you want to put it. And then afterwards, I'm going to give you some of my conclusions. Some of them will kind of be rants a little bit just due to the fact of, you know, my experience in the free, in the real world where, you know, the PEM buck doesn't really live in, but it, it does help set a standard to some degree. And then of course I'll allow a Q&A. So if you got any questions for me, you're more than welcome to ask me any kinds of question. And then at the end, I will leave the live with showing the references. And I will do my best to make sure that I can post those references to the YouTube um, video once it's posted on YouTube as well. So with that said, let's get started on the Space Challenger, the Challenger Space Shuttle. So um, all these are referenced, as I said. So the Challenger, the Space Shuttle Challenger um, was the second shuttle to really reach space. So there was kind of one beforehand. I didn't really get into that one because that's not really the focus of this um, particular subject. Um, so it did successfully complete nine milestone missions in three years. Of course, their last mission was the 10th mission and that led to some issues. Um, but of course, the interesting thing that I found was that it was only supposed to be a test vehicle. It wasn't really, I guess, meant to do more than that, but it was kind of fascinating why they mentioned it in the first place. Of course, um, in order to get an understanding of how we got to the incident itself, we also have to look at its birth, right? So the construction of the Challenger began in November 1975. It was with some other company that I didn't really put in here because I didn't really know them, but also at the same time, it was kind of like, okay, yeah, they built it. Um, but then, of course, in like, and you can see three years later, they eventually sent the Challenger to Lockheed Martin who started doing structural testing. So what's interesting is you have to think of the times. They didn't have what we have today. Today, we kind of look at things in the past and go, oh, why didn't they have this? Why didn't they think of this before? Well, because things were not as advanced as they are now. I mean, now we've got literally computers in our hands called, you know, smartphones. Whereas back then there wasn't such thing as, you know, a lot of really high tech computers. Like we now have laptops. They kind of had computers, but you know, they were they were still getting sophisticated over time, right? So of course, one of the unfortunate things they had is that there wasn't enough ability to calculate stresses on the shuttle during different phases of flight. They eventually got to that point, which obviously they did because they wouldn't have made nine milestone missions, obviously. Um, but it was one of those things where, um, you know, history and technology was just not on the side of this particular project either, um, because I'm sure they would have tried to make sure that there was some kind of safety features and if they noticed something that they then could incorporate it, right? But we're gonna get really into that um, after this summary and of course the key, key takeaways from this. So of course, um, here's the thing of the incident itself. So. There were a couple things that played a role, one of which was a delay because the previous shuttle mission, um, the 61C or the Columbia, it took them a while to get it down to the ground, which delayed um, the 
shuttle's mission, the Challenger, to go up and do its thing. So that's one of the causes. Then we get into the night before launch. And what happened was is that Florida experienced a severe cold, um, which caused the O-rings to kind of shrink. And then what happened was is that the O-ring shrunk and then it kind of allowed the gas inside of one of the rockets or whatever it is that's attached to then leak out as they were, you know, launching off. Um, interestingly enough, they were only 73 seconds into launch when the disaster occurred. Also, another interesting point that one source had mentioned was that the space shuttle disaster um, really had an interesting explosion because it wasn't like a full-blown explosion. It was one of those things where the explosion kind of encapsulated the um, where the crew was, but what really caused their deaths was that the oxygen levels decreased. They think that the oxygen levels decreased and then the people kind of passed out in, into unconsciousness. And by the time they were, you know, they reached the, the ocean, which was severe, heavy impact, by the way, um, they probably didn't wake up in time to do something like eject or whatever it was, right? And so that was one of the interesting things. But the other thing was is that what is rumored supposedly is that millions of people were watching kind of wasn't true. Um, they were broadcasting on some places in major television, but really that wasn't the case for this launch. Not many people watching because it launched at 11, I think, 30 from what one of the resources said um, in the morning, which most people, as we all know, most people are working or in school. So no one was really totally participating in watching this launch. But it did have a lot of, you know... Um, popularity I want to say I, I can't get the right word right now because of course they had a teacher who came from New Hampshire and she was chosen to be part of the mission where she would teach from the challenger for the entirety of her time up there with the crew in addition there was a launching of trying to launch a tracking and delay relay satellite um, which was part of this cha this 10th Challenger mission. And in addition to that, it was also carrying the Spartan Haley spacecraft to be that was going to be released um, so that that craft could observe Haley's comet during its closest approach to the sun. So those were the two goals that they were trying to achieve with this mission. And I, I kind of said it was a project goal because it kind of was. But there were some other things that you know, kind of lead into the next piece of this, which is some of our key takeaways here. So one of the things was there was unrealistic goals. And from a modern day perspective, 24 flights in a year is really unrealistic for the time, even from a modern day perspective. But of course, in the report that was conducted and then written out from the investigation, it turned out that, of course, what was stated is that NASA was trying to be like a business, which, okay, yeah, it makes sense because they want to justify their budget because, again, they're kind of from the government. And when you work for the government and you're a department for the government, you got to justify why you're, why you're in existence. And that includes why you need a lot of money. So it made sense that they were trying to have some kind of goal but it, again, it wasn't realistic. Um, one of the bigger issues was the quality and safety standards were not kept up. Um, so there was a lot of concern from these engineers who were, you know, helping kind of get this shuttle ready for this 10th mission. And they noticed a lot of issues. Um, one of the things actually that kind of irked me that I read from my sources was that originally, the engineers had told NASA management that this was not possible and due to these issues and so forth. But then what ended up happening was, was that their management from the company that came out of Ohio, the contractor, um, they later came back and then said it was like a, a misread or it, it wasn't, you know, it, it was resolvable. It wasn't a big issue, et cetera, et cetera, which, to me is again a demonstration of the real world with management, but we'll get into that with my conclusions as well. 
There was also a lack of a solid risk management process. This was heavily mentioned in the findings report that you can find online. Um, they did mention there were a lot of lacking of processes such as risk management, which makes sense because when you start you know, shipping people off into space, there's a lot of things that can happen when you're up there. And it's unlike here where, I mean, depending on what it is, you might have a little more easier access to get to, oh, I don't know, hospital people um, or nurses, EMTs, firefighters, you know, all that fun jazz. Whereas in space, there's kind of no one else around except you, your crew, and your ship. So that comes with it. And of course, launching. As we mentioned in the summary, there were a lot of testing that has to be done through different phases of flight. So, of course, there had to be some identified risk in terms of at this point in the flight, X, Y, Z could happen. But we'll get more into the planning and all of that. And then overall, just lack of project management skills, um, which we'll also get into in a bit when we come to the planning and the lack of a solid communication plan, which of course, even the report itself stated that the communication line with management and NASA was very, um, well, it was lacking for sure. Um, and you also had a lot of push for, you know, something that wasn't probably feasible because there wasn't really much data to go off of to really see if something that goal which was 24 flights in a year was really achievable in some way shape or form but of course this is where we're going to now apply our project management concepts so now we've looked at the key takeaways we understand the summary and the history a little bit now we can go in into the project management um, piece of all of this now I'm going to let you know right away I didn't do anything for closing executing or monitoring controlling because once you get past initiating and planning and you get a lot of problems, there's no point in looking at executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing because we all know what happened after that because it just wasn't a success. So as I said, the initiating phase is very important. Just like it's very important for the planning phase, you need to understand business value. Now, don't get me wrong, having a goal is not the issue, nay, nay. It's very important for your client to have goals because that helps you as the project manager when you're doing the business value analysis to understand what is it they're trying to achieve and is it possible? How can it be possible? What benefits are they going to get from it? Outside of also your benefit, right, for your organization and so forth. So the business value of understanding how does 24 flights really benefit NASA as a whole is one of those things that should have been looked at before even starting this project in the first place. You didn't have sufficient data to say, okay, well, is it feasible? Also, it didn't seem like in the planning, which we'll get into, was there any future what we call O&M or operations and maintenance work, meaning that if the challenger for this particular mission was successful, are we planning to build additional ships or additional shuttles like the challenger that can do the same thing so that it allows for the 24 flights? I'm sure nowhere did that even get mentioned for sure. But also, again, the why are we doing this also needed to be asked. And so this is why on this slide you see that business value was a complete fail because it feeds the business case and benefits management plan, which thus leads into the project charter, which in my professional opinion was still a failure anyways because no one really questioned is there real business value in doing 24 flights? Is this even possible? Can the shuttle really handle this? Is there a possibility that we can make more shuttles if it's a success? I mean, some people would say, well, yeah, commonsensically you should, but we don't know that there we don't have the I, I sure could not find an ability to find those documents and see if that was possible but from the research it didn't sound like it it didn't look like it and therefore it was just only solely relying on the the challenger itself which as we all know it's like um you know rides at a park rides at a park always constantly have to be maintained you always got to have alternative carts and different you know trucks or whatever that go on this ride because what ends up happening is let's say one of the trucks has a little issue or whatever you got to have backup so what would have happened if the challenger wasn't able to fly is there a backup 
no such talks of that, which is all part of understanding the business value that feeds the benefit, the business case and the benefits management plan. And then of course leads into the project charter, which you and your stakeholders also known as your client agree to that and say, yep, we definitely would do that. That is most certainly important. And we need to keep that in the forefront and understanding between the, the you know, all parties. So this was a failure. Which then, of course, leads into the failure of the project uh, management plan in the planning phase. Now, as I said, the planning phase is where you detail plan out your processes, which is feeding your project management plan, which is the blueprint of how you're going to do all these processes from beginning to end. So I'm going to go through each of the processes one by one. In terms of integration, it was very apparent project management skills were not being truly implemented because again integration is that conveyor belt that co makes all your processes work together in a cohesive whole well it kind of was apparent that that wasn't happening and we're going to get into why in a little bit with these other processes but that obviously was a failure scope was a bit of a failure because you know was that 24 flights really feasible is that something that can be done? So obviously it sounds like there was some vagueness in terms of, okay, well, if we're gonna have one space shuttle alone with no other space shuttles as backup to, you know, be able to handle this kind of direct, you know, um, heavy use of flights, um, what are some other things that we may need to take in consideration? Do we need longer oxygen time? Do we need to require more training for the astronauts? That sort of thing. Um, was not taken in consideration. Schedule, or it, it was kind of a fail because they didn't coordinate well when the Columbia was coming down. This is why their flight was delayed, so it's kind of considered a fail um, because they didn't make sure that they coordinated the timing right nor give at least some kind of buffer to say, okay, well, we know the Columbia's in flight right now. We're trying to get the Challenger up, so if the Columbia flight, let's say, is late by X amount of days, then you know it's not going to impact the Challenger's launch because we incorporated that buffering of when we could really launch the Challenger. Um, the other thing too is that, um, which will actually go into risk a little bit, but um, from a cost perspective, I think that could be considered a fail because they've just spent all that money trying to build a shuttle that then exploded and had serious quality issues and serious um, problems and that you know and, and in addition you got the loss of lives which is very unfortunate and rest in peace for them um, and, and so you have a lot of issues that you got to take in consideration which leads into the cost of quality and the cost of risks okay so I'm gonna do these two kind of together so the cost of quality and the cost of risk is part of the cost management chapter in the PMBOK and you need to understand how much is it going to cost you to implement the quality standards of your industry, government entities, you name it, right? And you need to take that into consideration because if you don't, you're just going to have a lot more defects and a lot of problems. And same thing with risk. You need to understand the cost of risk, meaning how much is it going to cost you to run a well-done risk management program or project, um, well, not really a project, but you know, a process that ensures that you are documenting accordingly your risk management um, items, your risks, your issues, and making sure that you're maintaining them, you're monitoring them, you respond to them accordingly when they occur, if they occur, because um, sometimes um, in doing your project, you may also um, resolve or well, not really resolve, but you may mitigate your issues to making them so minute and minor that it's no longer really a real issue because of the way that you um, addressed it in your project. But of course, as mentioned, like the O-rings, for example, have always been in question. Engineers were constantly talking about, hey, there's some issues with some of the qualities of the, you know, the, the space shuttle itself, some of the things we're building for it, et cetera, et cetera. And management and NASA were ignoring those engineers because they really wanted to get this done, which, okay, again, you know, got to have goals very important but there also comes a point you got to kind of go okay well are is that goal really realistic which we were talking about initiating and then for risk management again they didn't really have a real genuine process so we as a you know 
as the outsiders, we can definitely tell they didn't really want to document what would be some potential risks during, you know, pre-flight, during flight, uh, or launch, I should say, pre-launch, during launch, during space um, flight, while they're up there, and also um, coming back down from space. What are the risks in doing all this? And it seems as though NASA as a whole wasn't doing that in the first place and nor was the project management team from the um, company that was doing this they they didn't really incorporate any of that which was actually a recommendation in the report by the way from the findings of the uh, challenger space shuttle uh, disaster so that was one of those big things resources gets a pass because at least they had the right people you know they had the right people um so you know they had the smartest people in the room but again I think it was like Steve Jobs who said, you gotta have you don't hire smart people to tell them what to do. You hire smart people to tell you what to do. And that was kind of what was happening was that the smart people were there, but they weren't being listened to. And that's kind of a normal thing I I've seen a lot in my career. And we'll get into that when we get into the conclusion. Um, procurement, I'm going to also just kind of touch on this one. Procurement's not very applicable because in procurement you, you just need to make sure you have your items and there was no really talk of any issues with getting the items so I think they already kind of had it nor mentioning of procuring anything for them in the first place so that's an, a non-applicable communications now this is important because you need to be able to communicate when there are issues and be actually listening to listen to in communications management, they do mention that um, communication model where you got the sender who, you know, encodes their message, sends it to the receiver, the receiver decodes it, and then responds in terms of if they understood the message or not. And that was kind of happening. You know, NASA wasn't really listening to what these engineers were telling them, not paying attention to the fact that, hey, we might need to take in consideration certain things. Nay, nay, they were gun ho I want to do this. I want to get it done. This is what I want. This is how I want to do it. And that in, in itself is a failure. But that leads then into stakeholder management. And part of stakeholder management in the PMBOK is client expectation management. And they do talk about where you do need to manage expectations. And that's also mentioned too in scope management. And it was apparent that the company, um, the project management team from the company that was supporting this effort did not manage NASA's expectations in any way, shape or form and saying, hey, you know, maybe this isn't feasible. Or, hey, you know, our, our engineers are really, th this is a serious matter This the engineers are bringing forth to you. And I think we really need to take in consideration. Now, I'll get into my rants a little bit after this. But part of being a project manager, and this is why in integration management, the project manager is called the integrator for a reason. And that's because you are the conveyor belt that makes everything run. And that also includes that you are also managing the client themselves. And I'll get into that a little bit more after this, um, where I've seen time and time again, a lack of client management, um, in, even in agile projects. But overall, as you can see, for the project management plan, everything, most of things were a huge fail um, overall for the space shuttle. and. If they had done things differently for initiating and planning, they would not have had the issues they had when they launched the shuttle in the first place. So now that comes to my conclusion, which is also a mixture of professional advice to some degree. Um, if you're thinking of being a project manager, um, you don't have to take my word for it because I'm not really a consultant, but it's kind of some career advice if you really want to be a project manager or you can throw it in the trash, whichever way. I'm, I'm not picky about it. One of the first things is that people need to know when to say no. The PMBOK states this and even the Rita's PMP prep book that's in alignment with the PMBOK states this. You can't just be a yes man to every little silly thing a client wants. And time and time again in the real world, I have seen people just say yes to 
everything because they're getting money. So some people are like, well, yeah, they got to say yes because they're getting money from the client and they want money so that they can remain, you know, in business. Okay, great. But does that mean to the detriment of your team? Does that mean to the detriment of your reputation? You know, it, it, does that mean um, just say yes to them just so you can keep a contract where your client is maybe mm, abusive, not very kind to you, uh, you know, screams at your own people, um, which causes, you know, eventual turnover. Um, sometimes if it's really toxic and bad, you can have a continuous rotating door of resources all the time where you're constantly, you know, someone's leaving and someone's coming in. Someone's leaving, someone's coming in. You can see that constantly, especially with really bad projects, really, really bad ones. Um, but that's the biggest thing is that you need to say no. And if the company had, you know, said to NASA, no, this isn't good. We shouldn't do this. We, we need to make sure all functionality in this space shuttle works because you've got people who can die if something happened, which is a potential possibility, I don't think we would have had the situation we had if they at least said no. Now, would they have lost some money? Eh, you know what? Sure. But is it better to have a loss of your reputation than to have on your hands that, you know, you worked with someone who then ended up losing life? I don't know. Pros and cons here. Um, which then even leads to, you know, client management overall and difficult pushy clients too many times do i see clients just push and push and push and this is where again there's a lack of management in the real world really saying no to the client and just being honest and realistic with them and so they get very pushy and they want when they want something it's kind of like the kid you know that you see with their mom in a candy store right the kid just constantly pushes and pushes and pushes and the mom's like no 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 but then sometimes some parents they give in because they want the kid to stop harassing them about it or if the kid starts you know throwing a temper tantrum then they either cave or don't um, if they don't, obviously, they end up with, you know, everyone staring at them like, dude, are you going to make your kids stop or what? And then there's nothing else they could really do. Um, or they end up caving into the, the child and then, of course, they learn bad habits, which also can be the same for clients. Um, they can end up learning that, oh, if I'm just that much harassing about something, I will get my way. Well, you can't do that because not every harebrained idea they get is a great idea. And even in scope management, they say that. A client can suggest a scope item and say, hey, you know, I really want scope, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great, but that's not in alignment with the project, but I want it. Okay, that's great, but we can do that in a different project. Or if our contract has an O&M phase where we then start adding on additional capabilities along with maintaining the system, then yeah, we can do it in O&M. But I really want it. No. And the problem is, is that there's a lot of drive for money, which, you know, I'm not going to lie. Some of these projects I've been on, they were, they're a lot of money. But again, there also comes a point where how much are you willing to risk in terms of potential reputation damage, loss of personnel? I mean, if you even go on the internet and research a company, for example, that you're trying to apply to, how many people really don't, you know, not look at like, Glassdoor or LinkedIn and go, how's this company? What do they do? Do they treat their people right? Do they have good benefits? Do they take care of their people? Or do they claim they do and it turns out it's really bad? A lot of people do that. A lot of people research that to really figure that out. And it's the same for clients because they may figure out which clients are difficult. And of course, in addition to very pushy clients, those same clients are also the ones that ignore their smart people. And I've seen this time and time again where the smartest person in the room is telling them, look, you know, this isn't going to work. Or look, if you really want this, we need to make adjustments and be able to address this with those adjustments. And then you're going to get what you want. And too many times they ignore their smart people, which I'm going to be honest, most times, when the client's ignoring their smart people, trouble is brewing. Um, because what ends up happening is they listen to people who, well, sometimes just have no business 
telling the client what to do because they're not the ones really doing the work, which I've also seen way too many times from the project management leadership where they try and dictate things to the smart people. And it's like, are you doing the work or are they doing the work? And then it ends up being they dictate to the smart people, which, which sometimes, you know, smart people just say, OK, yeah, I just want to do the work and get it done. But that's not good either, because then they end up doing something that, you know, and it's extreme cases, I would hope. But I've, I've seen it where um, they start doing things that aren't right morally, ethically, or they start doing things that could really get them in trouble. Um, and maybe they might do things that you really shouldn't do in the first place anyways, just due to the fact of legality and morals and ethics. Um, and that happens. I did mention again that if there's not a proper risk management process, there should have been a conceded effort in documenting the risks. Now, as someone who has been in the real world and seen, you know, when documentation really helps, document, 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 document. I don't care if this client is your, you know, deputy's buddy, buddy, and they go out and drink beer and play golf on a Saturday, right? You need to document things. And it kind of was apparent that even the contractor to NASA was not documenting any of these things. Um, and maybe they were, but obviously it didn't really save them in the long run from what I can tell, but I didn't really look into the company itself and really see if they're still in business or not. That'll be something maybe I can mention in my next stream if I, you know, get around to it and figure out if they're still in business or not, even after the Challenger incident. But, you know, even if your client doesn't want to do something, that doesn't mean you don't do it. It's like what I always say when people are like, well, just because the client doesn't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Well, if your client says, I'm going to jump off this bridge, are you going to jump off the bridge with them? No, more than likely you're not. You're going to be like, dude, I'm not doing that. So same thing. It, even if your client's not doing proper risk management or at least documenting risks, that doesn't mean you, the contractor, doesn't do it. And you don't have to put too much effort into, you know, risk management if, you know, you're project doesn't require it. Although, let's be honest, the Challenger Space Shuttle project definitely needed heavy risk management processes because those risks are not needed to be documented. And those risks actually could have been utilized for future projects and for future um, other shuttles that NASA may have decided. But, you know, again, there wasn't any process. But that also meant that that contractor did not do due diligence and even document just to protect themselves and say, hey, look, we were doing what the client told us to do, which some people may feel that's not right. But at the end of the day, if your client refuses to listen to your smart people, they're being very pushy about something that you don't even know is feasible, let alone if it's backed by data to say if it's feasible, which means you don't know your business value in, re in real essence. And on top of that, you know, no matter how many times you say no, you end up caving to these clients, which some people may say, well, they're caving to them anyway, so what's the point? They're at fault anyways. But yeah, but again, it's like the coercion. Some clients are very coercive. So it may just be that, you know, someone above them, you know, at the contractor side may have came over them and said, just do it. The client told you to do it, just do it. And, you know, then, then that falls back into, do you really want to have something like that on your hands where you may have a really damaging failure like this one? So that is my long little rant about, you know, some of these things in the real world that I see. Um, and of course, it, this also falls into agile too. Um, nowadays, you see a lot in, um, if you're looking for a project management position, just do a simple Google search. Do anything on Indeed or, or um, Glassdoor, Monster, and look at the requirements for a project manager. They need people to understand Agile or even a Scrum Master position, which that's where you're kind of like a servant leader, even if you're not a project manager. And most times that I have seen is that the client likes the idea of Agile but they tend to get very antsy 
about it. I, that's not probably the best word for that, but they do tend to get very like, well, I don't know if I really want to do agile, but they, but they want to say that they have agile, which is always interesting. And they always base it off of their own interpretation, not what real agile is. In the entirety of my career, I've yet to see that happen. But then what ends up happening is that based on own interpretation of agile, people will end up doing things that in real agile you would never do. So for example, with Scrum, um, with agile Scrum, right? Once you plan a, a sprint, that's it. You can't really make many changes unless it's a very dire need. And generally speaking, that means that maybe something in the market has made the project in some way OBE and the client goes, uh, well, we've just realized that this thing's no longer really valid. This other thing though is a huge thing. We need to shift and pivot, but there still is some level of negotiation. There's still some level of compromising to say, okay, well, we're in the middle of doing these things. What you want, you know, what's going to go back in the backlog, for example? What needs to get reevaluated? Um, and that needs to happen. But in the real world, as I've seen, that doesn't happen. The client will be like, well, I changed priorities because I went into some meeting and now I need to change the priorities. And then people are just like, yeah, yeah, okay. Not questioning, okay, well, we already planned out the sprint, so what's going back in the backlog to make this other priority a thing? Or what's the compromise? Do we do half and half? Do we completely change the entire sprint? That becomes a conversation. But then again, as I said, if you got a pushy client and a client that doesn't want take no for an answer and, you know, again, ignores your smart people, well, you kind of got a problem. But, you know, depending on the client, sometimes people will wise up and say, you know, enough's enough. I don't care how much money you throw at me. We're done close the project, we're, we're done. Um, and that can happen. Um, I've yet to be part of that in the real world, I'm gonna let you know. That would be really cool to see, I'm gonna be honest. Not that I wanna see failure, it's just I wanna see how all this sometimes gets done and how people handle things like that because human nature is always interesting. But now that I've finished my entire rant, I'm going to now open the floor up to any questions and answers that you may have about what we covered, how we applied these things, um, anything of that nature. So I'll give you a couple moments to maybe answer or ask, I'm sorry, not answer, but ask. And I'll even open the chat and say, and say any questions, so. Uh, it didn't let me do it. Okay. I guess it's not allowing me at the moment. Okay. Well, whatever. Well, if you have any questions, um, you know, just feel free to reach out to me, you know, via message on Twitch, on TikTok, if you want to follow me there as well, or even on YouTube where I will be posting this live stream. So, with that said, I'm going to show the reference page now. And these are my references. Again, I will do my best to post these onto the um, YouTube um, video as well so that you have them and can, you know, go to these sites yourself and kind of look at them and so forth. Um, and as I said, maybe again in my next stream, which will be in two weeks, so not November 3rd, but it will be on um, November 10th um, will be the next stream. And hopefully the next subject will be just as interesting as the Challenger Space Shuttle. Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and your Thursday. And uh, see you again on the next stream.